Perdón, se me fue el mic. Hi, everyone. I'm looking for my mic. What's... Oh, in the front. Sorry. I'm being blinded. Thank you, Mija. Thank you so much for the introduction. How's everyone doing today? Aren't you happy to be out of class? No? No? Let's get some excitement going. Come on, kiddos. We're going to have a really good time. Come on, come on. Get excited. Get excited. That's half the battle. That's half the battle. So it was a great introduction. Let me tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, many of you have seen me walking around. You have uh, probably heard me yelling at kids to get in line, especially my kids during fire drills. Uh, you've probably heard me ca having you clear the halls and so forth. But that wasn't my beginning. My beginning and why I'm here with you all is that I was this little girl right here. I'm actually a published author. I published my book. It's called Through My Eyes, Domestic Violence Through the Eyes of a Child. Many of you may have the same circumstances that I had uh, coming up to school, having difficulties. But at one point, I had to make a decision. I had to make a choice. Was I going to be a victim or was I going to be a survivor? And I chose to be a survivor. And because I chose to be a survivor, I joined the Air Force. I became a staff sergeant. And that's why you hear my voice very deep, with a very deep voice when I'm talking to kiddos, and I can walk into an area and command the attention of everyone. The Air Force did that for me. Um, I, I hold several degrees. I do have my bachelor's in business management, a master's in education. I'm this close to finishing my PhD in general psychology. I am a proud mommy of two. I have a 26-year-old baby that's in the Air Force, and I have a 22-year-old baby girl who's almost, uh, who just started her master's. So all my kids, all my kids, como que tengo 100, my two little kids that I have, they're beautiful and they're following under, uh, behind my footsteps. Also, fun fact, I was born in Acapulco, Guerrero, Mexico, and I was invited to audition for the Selena movie in 1996. However, at that point, I was already pregnant with Cassandra, and so J-Lo took my spot. So J-Lo's not really my favorite person because she took my spot. I was invited uh, to, uh, to audition for that particular movie. But today, I want to talk about a really important uh, topic with you all. But I'm going to need your help for this particular topic. We are going to have to be honest. If we're not honest in this forum, then whatever I say isn't going to matter. And the reason why I told you what I've done and who I am is that so you can know what qualifies me to be in front of you. I have done many, many, many hours of research. I have lived what I'm about to talk to you about. So it's not something that I just woke up this morning and I said, la, 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 what am I going to talk to these kids about? No, this is something that is very powerful for me, and I hope that it's powerful for you as well. So first, I'm going to ask for some volunteers. I need some brave kids. I need kids that throughout the time that we're here together, You'll be willing to ask questions. You'll be willing to engage me in conversation. Can I get at least six kids that could say, I can ask questions. I know that I can get engaged. Six hands. Give me six hands. Come on, kiddos. One, come on up. Thank you. Thank you. Five more. Come on, kiddos. Let me have girls and boys because you, believe me, when we're talking, you're going to want to be up here. Let me, have, let me have a few more hands. Oh, you volunteered him. Outstanding. Come on down. Come on down. You right there. With, there you go. Yes, you. Right there. I'm looking at you with uh, white uh, earbuds hanging. You're looking around looking for someone else. That's you. That's you. Come on down. Come on down. Let me have one more boy and get the, what? You boys are going to go into the, uh, in, into the audience and you're going to pick three girls. Okay? Can we have one more boy? One more boy? Get volunteer or get voluntold. Come on down. Come on down. Very good. Good job. Let's give them a round of applause. Let's, yeah, yeah, they're brave. Good job. So now, start scoping out the audience, okay? If they look really quiet, if they look like they're really scared, get them up here. Each one of you gets to pick a girl. Go, go get, each one of you picks a girl. Go get a girl. Pick one and come bring them up. Let's go, let's go, let's go, kiddos. Go down there and grab her because she's probably not going to want to come up. That, that's right, that's right. Go get the girls. Grab them, and if they, if they pick you, you got to come up. If they pick you, they got to come up. Come on. Let's go, let's go, let's go. If they pick you, you got to come up. You've been selected to come up here. Let's go. Grab them. 
Who are you pointing to? Right there. Okay, stand up. There you go. There you go. Good job. We have one. We need two more. Make your selections. Make, just point them and we'll get them up here. Who do you want up here? Right there in blue. Dale gas. Vamos. Vamos. Okay. One more. One more. Okay. Who else are we selecting? I know it's tough. There's many of them out there. Let's go. Let's go. All you have to do is point. We'll get them up here for you. Who? Throw a chancla at her. Who is she? <laughs> Throw a chancla. It'll land on her head. Tell me what number. What is she wearing? Anybody. Pick a girl. All you have to do is girls. La güera. Where's la güera? Come on, come on. Where's she at? It won't be sexual harassment. Go on. You can tap her. <laughs> Don't be afraid of sexual harassment. Let's go. There you go. Be brave. Go get her. Orale, orale. Come on down. Give her a round of applause. Good job. Come on down. Okay, kiddos, come. Three and three. Two boys, one girl, three, uh, two boys, one girl. Take a seat on the bean bags. Okay? There you go. <laughs> Make room for her. You can sit in the middle or whatever. There you go. Take a seat, bean bag. Make room, make room. Juntitos con hermanitos. Pretend you like each other. There we go, there we go. Can we have a round of applause for our volunteers? Thank you, thank you. They so graciously jumped out of their chairs and came up. Well, the boys volunteered. You had to be voluntold, but that's okay. We still give you the points for it. Okay, great. So now, the next thing that we're going to be honest with is we're going to play a sitting up, sitting down, uh, standing up, sitting down little game. Okay? I know you. Vas a hacer pierna today. Vas a hacer pierna. Okay? I'm going to ask a couple of questions. And this could be about something that you have experienced or something that... Scoot over, scoot over. So we can get your purity faces. Let's go. There we go. There we go. Juntos, 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 juntos. Más, más, más. Más, más, más. Cuidado con el micrófono. Aguas con el micrófono. There we go. Good. Okay, awesome. Okay, this is something that either you have experienced or somebody that you know has experienced. A friend, a family member, okay? It could be in your family, it could be anyone. Stand up if you have ever been around adults that are yelling at each other. Stand up. Have you ever been around adults that yell at each other? The panel too. The panel too. Have you ever been around adults that yell at each other? Okay, great job. Okay, stay standing, stay standing. Stay standing if those adults were people in your family. Stay standing if those adults were people in your family. Okay, stay standing if you have been in a relationship where Someone, you or them, it could be you or the person that you were with, ever yelled in the relationship. Okay, okay. Okay, listen up. Now, stand up again or stay standing. If you've ever been in a relationship or you know of someone that has been in a relationship where people tell you, I love you, that is why I don't want you to talk to that person. Stand up if you know someone or you've been in a, in a relationship like that. I love you, that's why I don't want you to talk to that person. Okay? Very good. Okay, now, stay standing or stand up. If you or anybody that you know has ever been in a relationship where you're told, you're not wearing that. 
uh-uh, I don't want anybody else looking at you. You're mine. You're my girlfriend. You're my boyfriend. Okay? Stay standing or stand up if you or anybody that you know has ever played around pushing, pinching, or, okay, good, good. Stay standing or stand up if you or anyone that you know has been in a relationship where they use other names outside of cariño, my babe. They said, ah, you're stupid. Ah, you're an idiot. Ah, you're dumb. Why did you do that? Very good. Thank you so much. Go ahead and take a seat. Okay. So guys, this week, it was a little fun activity up and down, but everybody that you saw standing up and sitting down, welcome to the cycle of abuse. You have been part of domestic violence. You have been a part, and it's not a high five thing. And I'm gonna tell you why it's not a high five thing. Because people die with domestic violence. It's not a joking thing. There's many guys and girls that will suicide because of this matter. This is one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to y'all about this. Because in high school, okay, you don't ask enough questions. You need to have inquiry minds. This is the reason why I have these six up here. And then there's um, cast members on the side with a microphone. If you have a question, I ask you to, uh, to be inqui inquire, ask the question. We're going to talk about intimate partner violence. Can somebody tell me why I'm using the word intimate? What does the word intimate mean? I'm sorry? Private. Private. Okay, very good. That's a very good start. Private. Intimate. The microphone's on the bottom. We, so, so, we, so we can talk, you can pass it back and forth. So intimate means private. Somebody tell me, connect the word intimate and what we do privately. You know, come on, you can say it. What is intimate and we do it privately? Sex. Sex. Use the mic so everybody can hear you. Good job. <laughs> Good job. Yes. I'm not going to ask you how many of you are having sex. I'm not. I don't want to know. Dios los ayude, chiquillos. Dios los ayude. Okay? Because you're playing juegos de, de adultos and you're going to have to pay the consequences of adultos. Okay? But still, intimate partner violence comes from having sex. Now, at this age, I'm not going to be a fool and think that the majority of you are not having sex. And I'm not going to say that the majority of you may be, okay, uh, staying, uh, you know, keeping your virginity and not having sex. But intimate partner violence comes in through sexual intercourse. Because the moment that you start having sex with someone, you take ownership. That person belongs to you. They have been with you in a certain way that you don't want them to be with anybody else. And at that point, now that you have ownership, you feel that person belongs to you, and now you have certain rights. I don't want you talking to your ex-boyfriend. Hey, why are you talking to your ex-girlfriend? Why are you chatting with them? I don't like the friends that you have. Your friends don't like me, so I don't want you to be friends with them. And then it gets a little bit harder. When someone doesn't follow what you say, you think they're disobeying you because they belong to you. And you're like, I miss, I don't think that way. No, but you might act that way. And people around you might act that way. We know that in the Latino community, machismo is alive and well. I grew up in a household of machismo. You don't have to Show, my, show your hands or stand up or anything else. But in your mind, I want you to make a little checklist. I'm going to talk about my daddy. And you let me know if you have a daddy like I had. Okay, my dad has passed. But I'm going to talk about my daddy. My daddy was the king of the house. 
Think about if your daddy's a king of the house. What my daddy said was law in my house. My mama had to dress how my dad said she had to dress. My mom had to do what my dad said she had to do. If my dad said dinner is at six, dinner was at six, and dinner better be on the table by six. My mom cooked what my dad said. If my dad wanted enchiladas, guess what? Everybody was eating enchiladas because that's what my dad wanted. My dad brought in the money to the house. My mama didn't work. My mom's job was to raise us. So you welcome mama, because she made me and she raised me, okay? So her job was to raise us. She had four children. Her job was to clean the house, to make food, to keep the house clean, and to make sure that when she went out, she represented my father, which means that my mama couldn't hoochie up and dress any way that she wanted. Now, that's just basics. When my dad was not happy, my dad would yell. You don't have to tell me if your daddy yells. Just think about it. And there came a time when yelling wasn't enough that my dad felt like he could put his hands on my mother. Okay. This picture right here. Let's see if I can make this go up. Uh-oh, my battery is low. That's okay. Not a problem. The picture that I had up front with the book, I was six years old in that picture. That was the first time that I realized what domestic violence was. And people tell me, you look so sad in your picture in your book. And I'm like, I would, if you would have had my life, you would have been sad too. I remember the very first time that my mother lied to the children about what happened to her. And once again, all you have to do is don't have to tell me, but think if you have something similar to what I'm talking about. My mom and dad had come back from being out in the town. My mom got out of the truck. My dad didn't go and open the truck door like he should have, like a gentleman. No, no, no. My mom got off. He got off too. My mom's upper lip, right here, was swollen. And I didn't see my mama like that when she left. But when she came back, her face was swollen. Her lip was swollen. And I said, Mommy, ¿qué pasó? And that was the first time that I heard my mama lie to me about this. And she goes, me pegué. I hit myself. I'm like, what? I'm like, how do you hit yourself? You're not, you're not in sports. What happened? But then I turned and looked at my dad. And I saw something in his face. I saw arrogance. I saw the face of, ¿y qué? ¿Y qué onda? ¿Que me vas a decir algo? You gonna say something to me? I was six years old. I was like, hmm. I had that inquiry mind. What happened? As it progressed, it wasn't daily, but as it got further and further and further, now it started going over to the children. Now, the next time that I remember, my father's food wasn't to his pleasing. He took the plate and he slammed it against the wall because it wasn't warm enough. My mom had to pick it up, and my mom had to clean up, and my mom had to serve him another warm plate of food. At this point, we're like, wow, we don't even want to move because I might be the next one to hit the wall. Okay? It kept going. It kept going. It kept going to the age of 12 when I remember very specifically this day. Many of you, do you uh, might know what a canal means, a canal, okay? In Mexico, you don't have, when you're poor, you don't have swimming pools. You got canales, you go swim in the canal. And so we were swimming in the canal. And I remember my dad was not at home, so I went into the house and I wanted something to drink. And my mother was sitting in the, uh, on a chair by, with a little table that we had. And my mom had a piece of steak, un pedazo de carne, de bistec, on her face. And I'm like, what the? I'm 12. I'm like, why do you have a piece of steak on your face? When I asked her to remove it, her whole face, or half of her face, was swollen. And her eye was starting to blacken up. And at this point, I'm starting to understand something's definitely, definitely going on. I said, ¿qué pasó? What happened? And she said, nada. No, no, no pasó nada. I came to a realization that day that I was never going to be my mother. Never at the age of 12. So if I didn't want to become my mother and I only have two 
role models, who did I become? Talk to me. Who did I become? Panel, who did I become? My dad. I became my dad. So if I'm not the abusee, who am I, guys? You can say it. Who am I? I am the abuser. At the age of 12, Ms. Morton Silva became the abuser. You are not born an abuser. You become one. You become one because of what you see in your house. This is why I asked how many of you have been around adults that fight, that yell, that curse at each other. Because welcome to the world of abuse. You've already been thrown into it. You have no choice. You're little. And if you started seeing this as the chiquititos, it already started imprinting on you. And what it does is, you either believe that you should accept the abuse, or you believe that you should dish it out. It's that hard of a reality, guys. Now, do I say, I am happy I am an abuser? No, by no means, by no means. It is a tough life to be who I am. Because from the age of 12 on, I've had to fight the demon inside of me. I call it the Hulk. I call it the Hulk. Because many of you already have a Hulk and you don't even know it. Many of you walk around pissed off and you don't even know why you're pissed off. Many of you walk around and people look at you, you're like, ¿Qué estás haciendo? Why are you mad dogging me? You don't even know why you're doing that. You don't even know why people piss you off by just looking at you. You don't even know why someone, when they yell, te asustas. You get scared. And you're like, I don't want to have them yell anymore, so I don't know what to do to make them stop. So you do what they want, what, what, what those people are, are telling you to do, because you're afraid. You don't know why it is that maybe uh, certain sounds upset you. You don't know why certain looks, why somebody touching you a certain way, why certain words enrage you. Welcome to the cycle of abuse. Now, in your young minds, I want to tell you, you are not grown. And I know you hate hearing it from adults when we say you're not grown. You're not grown. I'm sorry, I'm telling you. Psychologically, don't make me bring out the books. Because remember, I have 65 hours under my PhD, under my belt. All I need to do is one research study, and I'm Dr. Morin Silva. I've researched this. You do not finish growing up cognitively to the age of 25. That's when your brain fully, fully, fully processes everything. Why do you think that under, age, under the age of 18 is called statutory rape? If an 18-year-old has sex with a 17-year-old, 18-year-olds, you're raping that person. That person doesn't have the mental capability, and neither you, do you really at the age of 18. But the law says that you're now an adult. So now we got to treat you like an adult. So now, on top of all of this domestic violence that you've already been uh, thrown into, let's throw sex into the mix. Sex will now mess up your brain. Because all the different emotions that you're feeling, you don't know how to handle those emotions. So now they turn into emotions of, this is mine, this is mine, this is mine. And if in your house, you've had to fight for things, like attention, because your mom is so worried about what, what to do to not piss off your dad, or vice versa, because women can be abusers too, right? And you don't want to piss them off. Then the other person's always worried about, Ay, no lo quiero hacer enojar. I don't want to make him angry, I don't want to make him nervous. So now on top of that, you don't wanna, you, you're afraid to lose the one person that tells you, you're so beautiful. I just love you so much. I want the best for you. I, if you ever leave me, I think I'll die. Or I'm going to have to kill you because no one's going to have you either. And, we, and when, when, when we're young, we're like, ay, es que me quiere tanto. Oh my God, he loves me so much. That's why he treats me that way. When girlfriends see it and we're like, why do you let your boy treat you like that? Ay, you don't understand. I am his world. That's why he treats me like that. It's okay. Until your world puts you under our world. Until you are so trapped into the cycle of intimate partner violence that you don't want to be here. 
And many of you, I know you're clicking it off. I'm seeing, I'm, I'm, I'm looking around the room and it's clicking. Many of you are part of the cycle right now. Many of you are with very abusive partners. Partners, I've had situations and, I, and I've counseled many teens where a student came to me and said, Miss, I'm really sad. Can I come in and eat lunch with you? I'm like, sure, 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 of course, come and eat lunch with me. And, they're, and I'm like, where's your boy? You're always hanging out with him. And they're like, well, he's not hanging out with me right now. He's mad because um, I didn't stop talking to this other person. It was a, 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 like an ex-boyfriend or whatever it was. Then they were just friends. He says, he's eating with his friends, but he's ignoring me right now. He won't eat with me. You know that when you keep your attention away from people as punishment, it's the same as you hitting them? You're punishing them. I'm not going to talk to you right now. Eat by yourself because you've made all, and I'm like, where are your girlfriends? Where are the other friends? Well, I don't have other friends because he became my whole world. We ate together at lunch. Nobody ate with us. He walked me to every class, so no, no, I didn't have any other friends to walk with. Um, he walked me to school. He walked me to my house. He's the only one that I talk to. So now that he's punishing you, you have no one to talk to? Pues no, mis. I talk to her about domestic violence. To this day, they're still together. It's not something you can get out of right away. Once you're in it, you really have to want to get out of it. But you have to make certain decisions. Am I ready, first of all, to get out of it? What am I afraid of? Why will I stick to this particular person? I know there's tons of questions going around in the United States, I had some stats for you all. Um, this is a growing problem. The reason why I wanted to talk to teenagers is because you know that IPV actually starts in middle school? Kids in middle school are having sex. Kids in middle school are less mature than you are. And they're controlling the little girlfriends. The girlfriends are controlling the little boys. It's happening. And now, it's going, spilling over into our high schools. Think about it right now. How many of your friends do you know are pregnant if they're females? Or boys, they, made some, they got somebody pregnant here at school. Because I see them walking around. I see them walking around. And then you throw a child into the mix. And once you throw a child into the mix, now you have something that's called a grenade. The girl can say, I'm not going to let you see the baby. Who are you hurting now? The baby. the baby and the boy. And now the boy can say, well, forget you. You take care of the baby. You're the one that had the baby. And the boy won't work. And we'll give her money for pampers. And the boy expects for the mom to take care of them. And then the girl sees no way out. And let's just say that boy completely leaves the, 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 the picture. That here comes another boy. Oh, I'll help you with your baby. I'll help you. And then they start having sex. But now this boy says, that ain't my kid. That ain't my kid. But if you want me to help you, you need to do what I say. And the abuse begins again. It's a cycle. And let's just say you break up with that person. Statistically, you'll pick that person again. You know why? Because girls will pick their dads and boys will pick their moms. You will end up, if you don't fight this, you will end up marrying somebody like your father. And boys, you will end up finding someone like your mother, statistically. Now, you could say, I miss Moni Silva, well is everything over with? Should I just, just forget about it? No. Right now, you have a victim mentality. I'm here to tell you, you need to have a survivor mentality. A survivor fights. But you just can't fight to fight. You have to fight with purpose. What do you want in your life? Take 30 seconds to think about where you want your life to be in the next five years. Think. And that's quick. 30 seconds is quick. That's how fast you're going to graduate from Bowie High School.
That's how quickly we're going to throw you into the real world. Five years, no one should be here. No one. Where are you going to be? If you're a junior, if you're a senior, yeah, you're gone. We're working really hard to kick you out of Bowie High School. Pass star in. Dale. Vámonos. Get into the real world. But now we have financial issues. Do you know that the number one problem with domestic violence is money? It's not the only problem, but it's one of the main problems, money. There's a saying in Spanish que dice, el amor sale por la ventana cuando el hambre entra por la puerta. Love jumps out the window when hunger comes in through the door. So when you start having monetary problems, you can't pay your bills, you don't have enough money to buy food, you start getting angry at each other. And when you get frustrated and angry, that's when the hitting comes in. That's when the verbal abuse comes in. The, why haven't you done this? I would be better if you never got pregnant. Or if you did that or if you did this, and now you're fighting so much that the boy wants to look for another girl that is not so, so drama, so much drama. And the girl wants to find a boy that's a little bit better than he is. And then we have a slew of other problems coming in. And now you want to beat each other up because you're cheating on each other. Do you see how the puzzle continues? One thing after another after another. The problem here, and look around, look to your left, look to your right. The majority of you are already in the cycle. You got up. You stood up several times. You're in the cycle. The question is, what are you going to do to get out of it? I want you to be really brave, especially my panel up here. I want you to come up with some questions, OK? Some questions that are deep, because I know this question's already in you. You don't have to tell me it's about you. You can just say, I mean, it, really, you can say a friend, you can say anybody, or just be brave enough to ask the question. Because I guarantee you, if you have a question, somebody else has a question. Go, sir. De lo que sea. Okay, very good question. If it's so easy to end a relationship, ¿verdad? Porque, why do they continue to hurt each other? Because it's called a codependent relationship, psychologically. Estás codependiente. You're codependent. You need that person for that. When you learn, when you grow up, that's a very good question, only knowing, <coughs> excuse me, drama, what do you need in your life? Drama. There's people that cannot live without abuse because all they've known is abuse. So you don't know what happiness looks like. You don't know what happiness tastes like. You don't know what being treated right looks like. So the only thing that you know is the bad stuff. So you're comfortable in the bad stuff. And so you keep swimming in that bad stuff. And that's why you keep hurting each other. It becomes a competition between each other because you call it love. Because people say, I, you quit so quickly. You should have stuck it out. You should have stayed with them. You know that that's why a lot of women don't divorce? Because society and religion and many other places tell them, no, do not give up. You keep fighting for that relationship. But he's beating your tail every day. What are you fighting for? People brainwash us to believe that we must stay in a place that's hurting us. This is where you stand up and say, I am better than this. I am worth more than this. I know my own value. I know what I bring to the table, and I'm not scared to eat alone. But you, someone needs to tell you how special you are. Most of the time, you're not told that you're special enough by your parents or people of authority. That's why. That's a very good question. I want people in the panel to think of questions that you have right now. People in the audience, yes. Very good. 
Good question. How can we help a friend get out of a toxic relationship? First of all, you got to be very patient. Because it, it has to be their time. It has to be their time. Second, don't ever tell them, I told you so. Because when you tell someone, I told you so, are they ever going to come back to share information with you? Another door will shut on them. And people need to have open doors, open doors, open doors, so that you're able to walk through the door. Imagine if every time that you didn't do an assignment in your, home, in your classroom, the teacher said, forget it, there is no redos. The first time that you fail it, ya se acabó. Would you ever pass? Teachers, we got to open a lot of doors for you until it's time to not open up a door. But you got to be patient. You cannot be judgmental. And keep encouraging them to get help. We have counselors here at school. Your guidance counselors, they all have experience. They all have resources. Your teachers, we're all equipped to help you. We will refer you. There are resources at school that we can guide you to. And sometimes just lending an ear. Sometimes just lending an ear. It, you can't do anything but wait for their time. When is it their time to get out? Now, if it, speak, if, if it becomes to where their life is in danger, speak up. Tell somebody. Don't stay silent. Because the next time you see them might be at their funeral. And then you will carry the guilt that you did nothing. I encourage you, look at the research numbers. Go and research how many teenagers die due to domestic violence. How many suicide because of domestic violence. There's girls and boys that have taken their life because their boyfriend doesn't want them back. Their girlfriend doesn't want them back. And now the girlfriend or the boyfriend have somebody else. And they're so grief stricken because they, they don't think they're good enough for anybody else that they'd rather take their life. Ask me another question. These are good questions, girls. What's in your mind? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Come on down. Well, this is a question, but I have a, I have a solution. Uh-huh. But I want you to answer me this. Yes. If a woman is dating this guy, and this guy is bad, he abuses, and this dude cheats on her, mm -hmm. why does her still with him? Even though he cheats, he told her to forget her family, and she lost everything. Mm -hmm. Though she has the power to go and get it back, but she don't do it because she's in love with him. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Thank you, very good question. It's called low self-esteem. That's why. She doesn't think she deserves any better. There are so many beautiful boys and girls who think they're ugly, who think that if I lose him, if I lose her, nobody else is going to want me because that person has made you feel bad about your body. They've laughed at you. They've said, ay, mira la lonjita. And you're like, now you're subconscious of your lonjita. Or the girl, could it also be girls? Girls are always looking, ay, mira this guy, ay, está bien bueno, está mira bodybuilder. And el, el novio está todo gordito. And the gordito says, ay, pues si dejo a esta nunca me, nadie, nadie más va a ser mi novia. And little by little, this is where bullying comes in. Be very careful, guys. Words hurt more than punches. When you make somebody feel ugly, when you make somebody feel less than somebody else, you've already scarred them. And for from them to come up from that scar, that's why, like for example, in my classes, I don't, like, I don't let kids say, hey, way. Because you know what way is? Stupid. You're calling them stupid. I don't like kids who call each other names outside of their name. What I tell my students in my class, cuando tú me enseñes el certificado de nacimiento que dice Wey Martinez, te dejo decirle Wey. Outside of that, their mama gave them a different name. So use it. Because a lot of times the abuse continues here at the school. 
If someone is not dressed right, if someone's not wearing the, the, the right type of shoes, the right clothes, doesn't look like the, the people on TV, because that's part of the problem. We want to look like people that is their job to look like that. Girls, we're constantly told that if we don't look like a supermodel, we're not good enough. Do you know that so many girls are getting plastic surgery? Because they want to look like Shakira and they want to look like everybody else on TV. But Shakira, that's her job. She gets paid to look like that. She has personal trainers. She has people that cook for her. No tiene otro chivo que cuidar. We do. You need to learn to love you. If not, your value will be placed on somebody else's lips. What other people tell you? That's why she won't leave. Doesn't matter. Está amarrada, está ajustada, porque dice, si este me deja, me van a dejar todos. And is it, are you all feeling sad for that girl? I hope you are. Because maybe you're feeling sad for you. The reality is you're feeling sad for you. Because I can tell you right now in this room, there's people that are saying, I'm part of that. I don't know how to get out. I don't want to get out. He loves me. Because you haven't seen love in your homes. All you've seen is abuse. So the little thing that looks like love. For example, y'all know those little chocolates that, are fo that they look like money? Los chocolates que parecen dinero? Los venden en bolsita? Are they really money? Can you trade them in? No. But if you, know that they're not, but if you don't know they're money and you think they're money, they're for their money. So it doesn't matter. It, someone te, te, pueden, te, te pueden aventar un pedazo de baloney. If you've never had steak, y te dicen, this is steak, you're going to believe baloney is steak. Until you have some steak. But I'm going to tell you something. Steak attracts steak. And baloney attracts baloney. So who are you? Are you baloney? Or are you steak? And being, ste and being steak, guys, you got to work at it. Because being steak starts in inside of you. You have to believe your steak. And steak doesn't put baloney down. Because steak no steak is steak. Steak tries to make baloney be better. And this is where you all help each other out. Do not cross each other. If you see somebody in a, in a, in a situation, you have to help them out. All of you all, la mayoría que ustedes separaron, you're part of the cycle already. And here's the thing, you either become the abuser or you become the abusee. Any other questions? Questions that you may have. You can ask about anything. You can ask about my journey. If you want to know how I deal with being an abuser, because you're not going to find too many people that say, hey, hi, I'm Lisa, I'm an abuser. Yes, sir. Okay, good question. How can we help a friend that is with someone just because she's pregnant? You show her resources. She's, a, she's in America. If she's in America, she has help. You let them know that whether people approve of it or not, she will have housing, she will have food stamps, she will have Medicaid, a slew of programs to assist. And that she doesn't need someone to raise that child. She wants someone to raise a child, which is very different. Wanting and needing are very different. And once again, be there, be there. Now I'm gonna tell you, is that you're, you're up against the battle because that person that got her pregnant is telling her, you need me, you need me. I love you, como me vas a dejar y con mi criatura? That person that is pregnant right now and won't leave that person if they're abusing her, has such low self-esteem that she needs to love herself before anything else. If, the, if that person is a true person, stop by my room. I'm going to give you a poem to give her, OK? Um, I don't know if I can access. If I can access my, uh, my Facebook, I will share a poem with you all. A poem in my book, I wrote several poems, and they were dedicated to my mother. They were dedicated to my mother because she kept us in a household. 
she didn't know what to do. She didn't know how to get out of it. And so, you know, I can't blame her for what she, for what she did, but it ended up hurting us quite, quite, quite a bit. Um, and, all, and all you can do is continue to be her friend. She's going to need you. The more pregnant she gets, the more scared she's going to get. And that, and that right there, being scared, it is definitely a, a very hard situation for anyone to be in. Because if you are scared, you don't know what to do. And you have to run. And where are you going to run? But to the person that gave you that baby. It's tough. We, we, we have to stand up. I wish from today that there would be a group of you that would stand up and work with me on creating an organization against this. I will help you run it just as a sponsor. But you, you, you have to be the one that moves it because my time has passed. I'm already an adult. I'm already a survivor. I have survived my father. I have survived the military. I have survived divorce after 18 years. I am a survivor because I know my worth. I know I'm steak and I'm not afraid to eat alone until I have the right person. Questions, guys, questions that you may have. I'm trying to find um, that it's a note that I want to leave with you all. If I can find it, I will read the poem that I wrote in one of the poems, one of the many poems that I wrote to my mom in the book. If not, I will pass it on to uh, Bear Talks so Bear Talks can publish the poem. It's called, Mommy, Do You See Me? And a little bit of the poem goes, Mommy, do you see me? Mommy, do you, see, do you feel my pain? Do you see my tears, Mommy? Every time he hurts you, he's hurting me too. I don't know what to do, Mommy, but I'm part of your hell. My future is in your hands, Mommy. You need to be strong like an, uh, like an oak, wise like an eagle. You need to fly over all this, Mommy, because my future is in your hands. I kept crying out to my mother, you have to do something about this. You got to walk away, Mom. The only thing that saved me outside of that life was that I joined the Air Force. I left. That's how I became a staff sergeant. I found a home in the Air Force. I found somewhere that I was going to be taken care of without being abused. Questions, questions. Yes. Say one more time. Can a toxic relationship be changed to a good one? Yes. But there have to be two people they want to work at it, and it's called therapy. And it's hard. Because both people, if it's toxic, both people are broken. And both people need fixing. And both people need to realize that they're broken. For you to say, hi, I am broken, is going to be really hard. Because you're going to have to accept wh who broke you. Many of you don't want to accept who broke you. Because accepting who broke you would be to accept that your parents have done something wrong. And that's taboo. We don't do that. Our parents feed us, love us, protect us. But at the end of the day, they can also break us. My mother's a wonderful woman. I love her to death. My father and I had a very interesting relationship. I'm going to leave you with this, guys. At the age of 17, Ms. Morin Silva had her father's murder planned out. I knew how I was going to take him out. I had the plan, step by step. My dad was a narcotraficante in Mexico. I am the product of the Mexican mafia. So he gave us a tremendously horrid life. At the age of 12, I spent an entire month in a Mexican prison because my father wanted us to be there with him. He was in El Cerezo in Reynosa, Tamaulipas. And because my father was a man of money, he was able to pay to not live 
100% in the jail. We lived still in the jail, but in a little workshop outside. There was still a lot of prisoners. For that month, my park was La Placita in front of the jail. My father had us in places where they were packing the drugs. I've been in huts where the walls all the way up to the ceiling were packed with marijuana, ready to be distributed. My father and my mother were near uh, victims of being taken hostage. There's so many things that I lived. At the age of 18, because I was in the cycle of violence, I was left at the altar. I was gonna get married at the age of 18. But the boy that I was gonna marry decided not to marry me because my father slapped him and called his mama a hoe. Yep. But the thing was, back then, he lied to me. He said he could pay for the wedding, and he waited for two days before the wedding to tell me that he couldn't pay for it. That time, we were engaged. We had already had an engagement party presenting us to the community as Mr. and Mrs. Vargas, or to be Mr. and Mrs. Vargas. And when my father went off on him, he decided to leave me with a wedding in my hands. It was an embarrassment that I had to face on my own. And that that didn't kill me made me stronger. I've had to survive a lot of things, but I did it because at one point or another, someone reached out to me and said, you're worth more than this. My mother told us we were worth a lot. She didn't show us how we were worth a lot because she didn't show me her footsteps. For my mother, to this day, somos sus tesoros. We are the best thing that has happened to her. My mother doesn't have to do anything. My mother today is rewarded with the fact that she has grown children. All my mother has to do is ask and my mother receives. My mom doesn't have to work. My mom wants to take a trip. We all contribute y la mandamos. My mom's gone to England. She's gone to Paris. She's gone to Jerusalem because she wanted to. She wanted to go to the church and visit where Jesus walked. And I'm like, what are the gas? So we all paid and we sent her to walk where Jesus walked. My mother always showed us the way by words, but she did not show us the way by steps. So I had to follow somebody else's footsteps, my father's. It, it has cost me a lot of tears to be my father. When you all see Ms. Morning Silva walking out there with a smile, Ms. Morning Silva has to force herself to walk around with a smile. Ms. Morning Silva is not a patient person. My students will tell you that if you've ever been one of my kiddos. I do not repeat myself. If you cross me once, you probably don't want to do it twice. As many people will tell you, there are adults. I'm very direct. I have to control a Hulk inside of me because the Hulk inside of me wants to slap the heck out of everybody who doesn't do the things that I want done and how I want them done. That's a battle that I have to face daily. Miss, how do you work with kids? Because kids are my sanity. Kids are my peace because I'm here for a purpose. I'm here to rescue kids. With all my degrees, I don't have to teach. I want to teach. I selected Bowie specifically. I had contracts in New Mexico with other schools wanting me to teach there because I'm certified to teach in Texas and New Mexico. But I wanted Bowie. I wanted mi gente, I wanted mi raza. Because mi gente y mi raza are the ones that are very afflicted by this. Does anybody have any questions? Any concerns? Yes. How much time you Nine years. I served for nine years. I was a staff sergeant. I had a deployment to Cuba as a linguist because I'm also an interpreter. And it was an amazing career. Amazing, amazing career. You may ask, Miss, why didn't you finish uh, your career? Because my husband at that time would not support me. Okay, I know what I'm talking about when I say that you're in a relationship where you're not supported. So I could have retired, but I didn't. I allowed someone to keep me from retiring from the Air Force. But never again. Never, ever again. Any other questions? I am located in A111. A111. If you ever need to talk, if you need a resource, Seek me out. You need to speak out, guys. Even if it's about a friend. 
because you're going to regret it if the last words that you say are at somebody's funeral, because it does happen. Intimate partner violence, people controlling you, people telling you what to do, what to dress, who to talk to, and then it escalates to holding you, no vas. And now, they just held you with, uh, without your consent. People pushing you, pushing you, people hitting you, ay, estoy jugando, were you really? Boys should never, ever put their hands on girls, and girls should never put their hands on boys, because that's where disrespect begins. Ever, ever put your hands on, on anybody. Unless it is to hug them, caress them, or show that you love them, don't you ever try to control a person, because what you're doing is you're being an abuser. And if you're allowing it, you're being abused. And if you ask yourself why, you're not gonna have the answers other than he loves me, she loves me. I don't wanna be by myself. It took me so long to get a boyfriend that if I lose this one, I'll never get another one. Any questions, kiddos, before I wrap up? I see a lot of thinkers and that's good. I hope you continue to think. I'm here for you. I don't know how long I'll be at Bowie, but I am here for you, okay? Thank you so much for being an amazing audience. And thank you, my panel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Y'all can get up if you want.